Around the world, nine million criminals behind bars. Armed robbers, rapists, and murderers. Most surrender to incarceration, but some fight back and escape. Tonight, John McVicker defies authority and risks losing his life. I was going to run out of steam. I was going to get caught or get killed. An Australian drug lord walks out of jail in a false beard and wig. None of the prison officers seem to be looking at him or paying him any attention. And in New York State, a small-time thief becomes a cop killer. We're just doing our jobs. And this guy wants to kill us. This program contains reconstructions. The prison breaks are real. Goulburn Maximum Security Prison, New South Wales, Australia, 1996. Former city councillor George Savas is serving a minimum of 36 years for conspiring to import heroin and cocaine. George Savas was um, the king of the underworld. He was a major drug dealer. He was an organised crime figure. He was brutal, he was nasty, and he was mean. And if you ever crossed him, your officers got firebombed, you got assaulted, or in the worst case, you were murdered. Before he was locked up, this Greek Cypriot city councillor was the dominant crime figure in the Sydney immigrant suburb of Marrickville. He liked to be referred to as the King of Marrickville. You know, he'd pull up in his red Mercedes sports car. He loved to lord it over people. He certainly had the flash car and the flash woman and with it, so he liked to live the high lifestyle. Savas made big money importing heroin with gangster Barry McCann. The former local councillor was the link man in Barry McCann's heroin ring. His job was to provide a corrupt customs man so the drugs had safe passage through Sydney Airport. In 1988, Savas ends his partnership with McCann in a hail of bullets. Barry was shot 28 times. And um, at the time, uh, Savas told the police that um, it was a kneecapping that had gone horribly wrong. But it was so horribly wrong that there was not, of the 28 shots, not one <laughs> was in the kneecaps. Savas beats the murder charge, but gets a minimum 18 years for conspiring to import 80 kilograms of heroin. He'd only been in jail two years and he was busy, busy, busy again, organising another importation. This time they were bringing, I think it was 40 kilos of cocaine from South Africa and 20 kilos of heroin from Bangkok. But the prison guards and police monitor the conspiracy from day one. And Savas was arrested and eventually sentenced to another 18 years of jail. And it was at that time that I think that Savas began plotting his escape. It's a plot so brazen and daring, it'll rock the foundations of the New South Wales prison system. Northern England, 1968. Her Majesty's Prison, Durham. A 200-year-old fortress of solitude, ruled by hard men with iron fists. A lot of the guards, you know, I think, to be honest with you, a lot of them got drummed out the Gestapo for cruelty. Hitler would have been proud of some of them. Three guards per man dominate E-Wing, a prison within a prison for the most desperate villains in Britain. Among them is career criminal John McVicker. Two years into a 23-year sentence for armed robbery and escaping custody. The special wing up there was built as a punishment block, uh, and it was pretty brutal, and the idea was to break people. John McVicker, two years for shop-breaking and robbery, three years in Wandsworth for riotous assembly, and eight years for armed robbery and assault on the police. A professional career criminal since his early teens, John McVicker is in E-Wing because he's already escaped maximum security. I had no more life to, to lose. I'd lost it all. Um, so that was my motivation, and that was my kind of take on things. My life was over, and therefore, I've got to try and escape. But getting out of E-Wing is considered impossible. I'm a professional safe cracker, you know? You would have breed him a wrong. But E-Wing, you had to get out of the prison to get out of a prison to escape from a prison. 
but at age 26, with a 23-year sentence before him, John McVicker wants out of the prison within a prison and is willing to risk his life. One of the prisoners was a guy called um, Wally Probin, who was serving, I think, 15 years uh, for a shooting at a policeman or something like that. And he was continually trying to escape. Um, and he, he was incredibly uh, smart. Probin discovers a false brick wall in the shower room, hiding a shaft leading to the roof. He made a chisel in, in the workshop. They used to do raw iron as a hobby. And he used to go in the workshop and he used his hamster cage to smuggle stuff in and out. I mean, I, I mean, I know it's farcical, but it's true. He had this bloody hamster. And I used to put the tools inside the, the metal cage and pass it to the screw. And, well, the other screw sort of put the metal detector over and he used to give me back the, uh, the tools. <laughs> Armed with a five pound dumbbell and their smuggled tools, McVicker and Probin spent six weeks chipping away at the brick wall. The only way we could um, cover the noise was to use the weightlifting equipment outside where we were digging. And we really had to hammer. Then we would get someone working on the weights to try and coincide with the bangs. But they also need to cover up their work. So Probin takes on a new hobby, papier-mâché. Probin was always had hobbies going, and they were supplying with paint. So we could paper mache between the bricks, just put them back. It looked like sort of mouldy plaster. But as the broken brick parts are replaced by papier mache, they create a disposal problem. There was a building works on the other side of the wing, just outside our wing. And um, we worked a system by which we could um, take with this, the bricks that we wanted to get rid of, and we used to just throw them out the window onto the rubble. After two and a half months of undetected digging, McVicker and Probin finally break through. But the shaft to the roof is too narrow. Instead of going up, we found we could drop down into an old disused cellar. The plan to get to the roof has failed. They're still caged, now underneath E-Wing and the nearest perimeter wall is a heavily guarded prison yard away. Coming up, in New York State, a small-time thief has a county up in arms. It started out as a funny story, and it became a tragic story, and a, a, a story that caused a lot of anger and a lot of pain. New York State, April the 2nd, 2006. The Erie County Correctional Facility, Buffalo, New York. Local small-time thief, Ralph Bucky Phillips, is near the end of his latest sentence, 90 days for parole violation. He was a, a very non-threatening, non-violent. People liked him. He, you know, he was kind of like a folk hero down there. He stole cars and motorcycles, never harmed anybody. But working here as a trustee in the jail kitchen, Bucky Phillips begins a journey that leads to murder on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. The Bucky Phillips story sort of grabbed much of the state's attention in the summer of 2006. It started out as a funny story and a quirky story, and it, and it became a tragic story and a, a, a story that caused a lot of anger and a lot of pain and a lot of grief. Bucky Phillips, part Seneca Indian, has a criminal record stretching back to his childhood. As a boy, he was stealing bicycles and, uh, and they moved up to tractors and then, and then cars. Bucky spent most of his time, most of his life in prison, whether ju juvenile detention or state prison or county prison. But after 20 of his last 23 years behind bars, Bucky wants out. The escape was uh, interesting and, and bizarre to people because it occurred only three or four days before he was supposed to be released. Even more bizarre, Bucky Phillips cuts his way out of prison with a can opener. Like a tuna can or something. <laughs> Using a refrigerator, Bucky boosts his way through a hole he's cut in the ceiling and gets access to the roof somehow gained access to a screwdriver, 
and it's a metal roof. Well, I think he propped the holes with the, the screwdriver and then used a, a can opener to literally cut his way out. There were motion detector sensors there, but they weren't working because birds kept setting them off. And so the prison had just kind of shut them off, I believe. An alarm finally goes off in the jail security center that Bucky has reached the open fields around the prison and is running towards thick forest. He's a, a very physically fit person, very muscular build, um, runs probably less than a five minute mile. A very, uh, very much of a specimen. In a few minutes, Ralph Bucky Phillips is racing through a trackless forest he's been exploring since he was a small boy. But heavily armed state troopers are closing in fast. New South Wales, Australia. Goulburn Maximum Security Prison, July 1996. Former city councillor George Savas is serving 36 years for drug crimes, including 18 years for an importation he organised from behind bars. And that's where the really big money was. I mean, we're talking about, you know, $20 million. The drug trade has made Savas a wealthy and powerful man. Prison authorities had been alerted to the fact that Savas was planning an escape. That's why he was actually moved to maximum sec security. But even maximum security Goulburn is no match for such a rich and intelligent criminal. He uses cash to buy his key to freedom. On the day in question, which was July 6, 1996, he was in the visitors section of Goulburn Jail. But on that occasion, there were only six prison officers for 90 prisoners. At 12.30, two visitors sign in. And I think no one actually noticed it was winter, but they were wearing a lot of clothes. Just after two o'clock in the afternoon, other prisoners created a distraction. So the small number of prison officers that they were were over handling a fight over in the other corner. Then what happened was that Savas stood up, took off his prison overalls, put on a jacket, a grey jacket that one of his two visitors had brought in, donned a blonde wig, put on some Ray-Bans, false beard, and the three of them just stood up and at 2.30 they just walked out. And amazingly, they just keep walking through six checkpoints. Not one person in any of those security checkpoints actually bothered to stop them or to question them, and he was gone. Police tonight have launched a massive search for notorious drugs boss George Savas following his dramatic escape from Goulburn Jail. Changing into clothes brought into the jail by an accomplice, Savas defied guards and security cameras by walking out of a makeshift visitor's centre being used while a new one is being built. I think it was very cunning, very well planned, and this fellow has the financial and human resources to assist inside and outside the correctional centre. It was later discovered that even though there were surveillance cameras everywhere, no one was watching them. In just 20 minutes, George Savas is back on the street, while the authorities scramble to explain how such a dangerous criminal could just walk out of jail. Northern England, County Durham, 1968. Durham Maximum Security Prison, one of the toughest jails in Britain. Here, hardened criminals are caged in a human zoo. Criminals are the scum of the earth, but their catchers and keepers are the dregs of humanity. Armed robber John McVicker and gunman Wally Probin dig through a false brick wall and drop into a disused cellar. When we broke through into the cellar downstairs, I suddenly thought, I'm going to get out. In the cellar, a barred ventilation shaft leads to a closely guarded exercise yard. On the other side of the yard, the perimeter wall and freedom. Once I knew that I was going to get near that wall, I knew I would make it, because I'm very fit and strong and, and determined. For a whole month, 
McVicker and Probin take turns cutting the bars with a hacksaw blade, smuggled out of the prison workshop. We'd work about an hour, hour and a half. Occasionally, we'd have a break and just see if everything's OK. And, but generally, we worked every day. The guards are a constant threat, but their biggest danger is another inmate, gangland boss Charles Richardson. He just had this um, streak in him. He just tortured people. Anyone crossed his path. Richardson threatens to dig a fake tunnel where the guards will notice. His little bit of digging out that would have created mayhem, they would have found our hole then. Um, and so we had to uh, bring him in, and then there'd be four of us, him and his mate. McVicker and Probin work through the daily threat of detection and betrayal. And even if they get through the bars, they still have to scale a massive stone wall. We made ourselves um, hooks and ropes, um, clothing, all the stuff you'd need to get over the wall. On the night of October the 29th, 1968, while Richardson and other inmates watch a movie in the rec room, McVicker and Probin climb down into the cellar and change out of their prison uniforms. And we went without telling Charles Richardson. You know, we double-crossed him. They crawl through the shaft into the exercise yard, but Richardson and his mates are onto them. They heard a little noise and they looked out and saw us, and Richardson started shouting at us, you bastards, you bastards. It was like to tell the warders that we were escaping. McVicker and Probin cross the exercise yard on top of the prison wall in less than a minute. The alarm bells were going, and there was warders shouting and screaming, torches and all that sort of thing. So it was obviously going to be a hard go. They race along the perimeter wall, still hoping they've got enough time to escape. But we looked over the wall, and there were, like, 40 walls, and they were st stringing out across the, at the bottom of the wall. And one of them spotted either, either myself or Probin. Like, there they are, there they are. And the dogs were then going, you know, crazy, and people were shouting, you know, he's there, he's up there. Probin and McVicker, however, continued climbing until they came out on the roof of the courthouse, which is part of Durham Jail's complex. Here, the two of them parted company. And at one stage, I looked back, and he wasn't there. And I just thought, well, you know, that's it. He's going his way, I'm going mine. Probing his court almost immediately, giving McVicker the extra time he needs. I clambered right across the, um, all the buildings uh, that constituted the courthouse. I think I actually went over the front gate of the prison itself with people driving in and out. And I dropped down then into some gardens. And I heard a load of warders running past. And um, I let them go round, and then I followed them, because <laughs> I was that confident. And I saw a road. I went past the police station. I just walked past it. Confident and determined, with dozens of warders and police in hot pursuit, John McVicker vanishes into the night. New York State, April 2006. The Erie County Correctional Facility is the start point of a manhunt for part Seneca Indian, Bucky Phillips. His whole goal was to stay in that general area. Small-time thief Bucky is literally on the run through a wilderness he's known since he was a boy. He hunted, he fished, and he, he spent a lot of time in the woods. That, that was it. It's almost like he spent his whole life preparing to run away from authorities. Bucky Phillips believed that he, that his parole was about to be denied, and so he was going to spend several more years in prison, when in fact, he had a very short time left, and he, when he would have been legally released. Bucky has no trouble avoiding capture and he quickly becomes a local legend. When he was running and, and getting away all the time, it, it, it became almost like, you know, fairy tale type thing, almost like a Robin Hood. To the locals, he's just a lovable rogue. So it was just Bucky, they were, they were feeding him, they knew him as a kid, he, was, he never harmed anybody. If there was such a thing as an honest thief, I guess that's what he was. He is clever and smart and funny and is somewhat charming. But he's also 
a, like a boy in a man's body. It's a bit, you know, immature. Back in the forest, Bucky survives off the land. He eats berries and drinks from mountain streams. He would come upon an empty camp, uh, empty, empty trailer, and spend a couple of days there and take whatever he wanted out of that person's freezer and cook it and eat it. Weeks go by, and Bucky becomes more daring. He raids small settlements scattered through the forest. He tells us one story where he, he came upon a, uh, a grill of someone was barbecuing in the backyard with hamburgers on it, and, and the, no one was standing around. So he took a couple hamburgers and ran away. But then Bucky gets a hamburger of his own, the Bucky Burger, to be eaten on the run. He said that he, he never had a Bucky Burger, but that he did spend some time in that diner at some point around that, that time, and that troopers walked in once when he was sitting in the diner, but that no one uh, told the troopers that that was Bucky. And when he runs into the troopers, Bucky uses a simple escape technique, his feet. I saw Bucky on one occasion, and instantly, like a flash, he was gone. He told one story where he walks out of the woods onto a, onto a road, and there's two state troopers there. He didn't anticipate running into them, and he said, whoa. And he turned around, and he ran back into the woods as fast as he could. And the state troopers followed him and followed him, and eventually they lost him, and they themselves became lost. Well, he's running through these woods at high speed, and we're going tree to tree for cover. And we're advancing as we're trained. And he says that he sat on top of a hill and watched as a helicopter overhead searched for the troopers to, to pluck them out of these woods. And the Bucky had a big laugh and, and was smoking a cigarette and watching the whole thing. But he won't laugh for long. The police target his girlfriend, and Bucky Phillips turns from lovable rogue to vicious killer on the run. Coming up, John McVicker becomes public enemy number one. All that could have stopped me is a bullet. And in Australia, police close in on a high-living drug boss. Rather brazen, really, to be in such a high-profile restaurant. New South Wales, Australia. Goulburn Maximum Security Prison, 1996. Sydney gangster George Savas is back on the street after putting on a false wig and beard and just walking out of jail. None of the prison officers seem to be looking at him or paying him any attention. And yet this was a maxim, maximum security prisoner. He should have had somebody keeping an eye on him personally at all times. It is suspected that Savas may have used his wealth to bribe guards. Today, embarrassed prison staff were forced to admit to the minister that they'd been outfoxed by Savas in a meticulously planned escape involving no less than eight people, including four fellow inmates. But an inquiry fails to find evidence of corruption. He was smart. He understood how to play and manipulate the system. Guards were also distracted by what prison officials say was an unrelated tip-off that drugs were to be exchanged during visiting time. If the person watching the monitors was watching anything specifically, it was the table where we thought drugs were going to be passed. Savas evades recapture for eight months. He lives the high life in Sydney. But on March the 20th, police get an underworld tip-off. The Sydney drug boss who walked out of jail in a blonde wig is back inside tonight. George Savas, no wig this time, but with a black beard, was arrested eating in one of Sydney's best-known Japanese restaurants. He was dining at the very upmarket Suntory restaurant with what police later described as two good sorts with him, a blonde and a brunette. There was actually a suggestion that they might have been high-class call girls. Sent him enjoying himself uh, quite freely, which was rather brazen, really, uh, um, to be in such a high profile restaurant. It was crowded. It made us, uh, you know, really doubt at that time whether or not that was in fact George Savas. They call for a fax of his mugshots. His appearance had changed uh, significantly since the time of his escape, and uh, the photo that we had. Uh, did not really resemble the person that we were looking at in the restaurant. They approach him anyway, 
We asked him if he would uh, come back to the police station where we could make some further inquiries, which he agreed to at that point. And as we were walking outside, uh, he attempted to run from us. Nick uh, went round the, the legs and I went round the top and, uh, yeah, tackled him on the ground. We uh, took hold of him again and at that point uh, he all but admitted that uh, he was George Savas. As we were walking him to the, uh, the paddy wagon, he, he did make a comment along those lines that uh, I suppose I should have left Sydney and uh, not a true word spoken, really. Savas is back inside, facing a minimum sentence of 36 years and awaiting trial for escaping custody. I mean, 36 years for a man who was 46 or 47, that was the rest of his life. He won't be able to move unless someone sees him and asks why. Savas spirals into a depression. He wants to get out and he finds a willing accomplice, the backpack serial killer, Ivan Milat. They had built a makeshift rope ladder and they were going to throw the ladder over the wall. They had armed associates who were waiting outside who were going to shoot any warder that stood in their way. Two of the most vicious criminals in captivity plan an escape Australia will never forget. Durham, Northern England, October the 29th, 1968. Armed robber John McVicker is on the run after busting out of high security Durham prison. <laughs> if McVicker had been in Alcatraz in the days of Al Capone and the days when they said it was a fortress, he would have danced out of there blindfolded. Durham is a tiny medieval city, almost completely surrounded by the River Weir. You see yourself, Durham City isn't a big city. It's small but very compact. And really, Durham City, it's no hiding place. And the manhunt intensifies by the minute. I heard these walkers rushing past. I thought, I could get out now and none of you could stop me. I, you, none of you could catch me, because they're not armed, and that's all that could have stopped me is a bullet, because I was super thick. I, I remember running past one guy. He looked at me very strongly, and I just thought, what can you do? You can't do anything. I, I was that confident. We saw a man coming around the corner. As soon as he'd gone past the corner, he broke into a, a great run and went past us extremely quickly, headed towards the, um, the river. McVicker has no idea where he is and runs headlong over an embankment down to the River Weir. I hit the bank and suddenly I was treading on air when I thought, if I'd broken something, this could kill me. He hears police dogs getting closer. I got down to the water's edge and swam across the river very gently, and I could now hear quite a lot of a um, bit of a manhunt going on, dogs and stuff. And again, I thought, well, they can't catch me. Confidence growing, McVicker decides to stay in the river. And I thought, oh, well, I'll swim out of that'd be easy. And suddenly, I realised I was going to really drain myself of energy, and I thought, I can't swim out down. And I got so cold, I crawled out. Freezing and close to hypothermia, he finds shelter. I mean, I'm very sort of versatile. I can sleep in a ditch for two days, and I was that kind of person. I can go with that water for a couple of days, food for 10 days. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a problem for me uh, to find a place to hide if there was a massive manhunt and I couldn't move. McVicker lays low for three days and is on the run again. But 12 miles out of Durham, he finally runs out of steam. I'd overreached myself physically and sort of mentally, I didn't have any reserves. Physically, I was depleted and mentally I was as well. He finds a phone booth in a small village and calls an underworld contact in London to pick him up. And I came out and I saw these two guys coming to, I knew they were policemen, plain clothes. And they just said to me, I remember one was ginger hair, and said to me, uh, can we have a word, sir? So I just looked at him and took off. And I just left them for dead. New York State, June 2006. Small-time crook Ralph Bucky Phillips is enjoying life on the run. 
When I spoke to Bucky Phillips, he said that that escape and the summer he spent on the run was the most fun he's had in his whole life. Running literally from hideout to hideout in thick forest, this part Seneca Indian has evaded capture for over two months. He stayed in areas where he was familiar with, and he did a lot of hunting. He was an outdoorsman. Bucky Phillips is also a lifelong thief. He breaks into isolated houses and stores in small towns to stock up on food and equipment. He acquired some guns, money, stuff to live on, but he had a support network also. People who were fellow inmates, family, friends. You know, keep in mind, he was still Bucky, that guy that people liked. So he, had a, he was welcome in a lot of communities here. To Bucky, cars are free toys. Mustangs are a real favorite. He would steal cars, which is not hard to do in Chautauqua County because people leave their keys in the car. It's, you know, they'll put them up like in the visor. On June the 10th, 2006, he's pulled over by two state troopers in a routine traffic stop. Bucky looked in the side view mirror and over his shoulder fires the gun as he's smiling into that mirror looking at the troopers approaching. Smiles at the troopers, over his shoulder, fires a couple rounds, striking Sean Brown. Trooper Sean Brown has serious gunshot wounds to his abdomen. He survives, but Bucky has turned a fatal corner. You're looking at a very muscular, physically fit, woodsman, career criminal, institutionalized, who's now violent? Yeah, it was a recipe for disaster. Now, this guy was starting to shoot police officers, which he, had, he really he hadn't, done, he hadn't done before. So now it was very important to do whatever was necessary to capture him. Game's on. Oh, game is on. It became extremely intense. Now there were troopers everywhere, on every street corner throughout Chautauqua County and all through the woods. There were troopers everywhere. On August the 31st, they pay special attention to this isolated farmhouse. Wiretaps reveal that Bucky has been here to visit his old girlfriend. They had troopers watching it from various places. They had two troopers in particular in camouflage outfits hiding in the woods watching the house. SWAT team members Don Baker and Joey Longobardo are heavily armed with automatic weapons. While they're on this, this listening observation post, Bucky came across them. Uh, he fired on them, striking Don Baker in the abdomen and Joey Longobardo in, in the leg. He said he believed that they were bounty hunters, that they were not, in fact, troopers. Then he said that these men began firing at him, and so Bucky returned fire and ran away. When he ambushed those two troopers with a high-powered rifle, and, and ambush is the correct word, they didn't stand a chance, then, then, then he no longer was a comical figure. Now he was a dangerous person. He, he would sneak up on two men in the woods and shoot them. That changed everything, and all sympathy for Bucky basically went down the drain. In the next few days, Bucky Phillips gets a simple choice. Throw down your gun or pay with your life. New South Wales, Australia. Maitland Maximum Security Prison, May 1997. Drug importer George Savas and serial killer Ivan Milat are ready to execute a violent breakout plan. George Savas would have stopped at absolutely nothing. He certainly was a criminal who would go to any lengths to protect himself, but also to advance his activities. Savas is facing a minimum of 36 years and faces more years for escaping custody. Milat is serving seven life sentences. Ivan Milat was not next door to him, but he was in the same wing. And they apparently associated, you know, like I think during um, 
daylight hours. He would have been a desperate man taking desperate measures. But unknown to them, the plan is compromised from the beginning. They were monitored uh, very closely. And on the night that the escape was supposed to happen, a car load of heavily armed associates of the men were actually um, caught in surveillance near Maitland walls. On May the 17th, 1997, the plan falls to pieces. Malat and Savas have been planning to flee with two other inmates by tying up guards, stealing their uniforms and climbing the perimeter wall using two ladders. But prison authorities were ready for them. This property store would have been the flashpoint for yesterday's escape bid, providing just about everything Savas and Malat would have needed to complete their getaway. But watching their every move, a heavily armed, highly trained squad of prison guards on standby after weeks of electronic surveillance. They just swooped on Malat and Savas. So even though they hadn't attempted to escape, I think they just thought, well, look, you know, we'll arrest them now. Police are still hunting two men waiting outside the jail in a getaway car. George Savas's millions haven't been enough to buy his freedom. That was his last throw of the dice. And I think he realised that. The worldly belongings of George Savas are removed from Maitland Jail after the notorious drunk baron is found dead in his cell within 16 hours of a foiled attempt to escape with backpacker killer Ivan Malat, Savas hanged himself. Savas hanged himself from a bed sheet. There were a lot of questions asked later. How could a high security um, inmate who supposedly on watch 24 hours a day, actually be able to kill himself. The official finding is suicide. The ultimate escape from a minimum sentence of 36 years. Coming up, it's the end of the road for Bucky Phillips. If they get him in sight, they're gonna shoot him. I know they're gonna kill him. And the underworld turns on public enemy number one. I got betrayed, but I was going to get caught anyway. I'd run out of um, options, run out of ideas. New York State, September 2006. Three months after escaping prison, small-time thief Bucky Phillips is a dangerous gunman on the run. You know, we're just doing our jobs, and this guy wants to kill us. On August the 31st, 2006, New York State Troopers Joey Longobardo and Don Baker are watching this remote farmhouse, belonging to Bucky's girlfriend. He came up through the woods from behind them, and Joey Longobardo screams out to Don, get down. And that's when Don spins around, sees Bucky's about 20 yards away, 20 meters away. And that's when he starts firing, and then Joey returns fire. Don Baker is shot through the stomach and back. A bullet hits Joey Longobardo in the leg, severing a major artery. Freeze, police! But he keeps shooting as Bucky runs into the forest. He said he was climbing up a hill with, on his hands and knees, and a bullet hit, struck between two of his fingers. It didn't hit him, but it, it spooked him, and he knew that he was in big trouble. I just got home. And I got the phone call. Like, two swaths are shot. I drove back down there. Donnie, who's a former nurse, to me, looks to be mortally wounded. He's shot in the stomach with a rifle from close range. And we put him on the ambulance, and we run back to get the second stretcher. And there's Joey, laying there. And he's got a wound in his leg. But he's almost completely lost color. And he has that look, that, that look vacant stare in his eyes. Three days later, trooper Joey Longobardo dies after a leg amputation. The death of that trooper changed everything. Uh, Bucky Phillips was no longer a romantic cult hero. He was a, a killer. He was a, a, he was an assassin. One guy, one guy, one selfish, arrogant bastard who didn't want to go back to jail and how much how many lives did he alter because of that? Ralph Bucky Phillips is on the FBI top 10 most wanted list. With a $400,000 reward on his head, 
and hundreds of police are on his trail. Yeah, really, those moments that you get sick to your stomach moments when we realized that he had committed a burglary at a gun store and walked away with, I don't know, 20, 30 guns, some of these high-powered rifles. And Bucky's sister has no doubt about what's going to happen next. They're, they're not going to ask questions. They're going to shoot him. If they get him in sight, they're going to shoot him. I know they're going to kill him. On September the 8th, Phillips is sighted by a trooper and is rapidly surrounded in a small section of woodland on the New York-Pennsylvania border. I think we had 10 or 12 different SWAT teams from across our state, not including Pennsylvania, out there working. We'd probably be in excess of five, 600 police officers. Surrounded with nowhere to go, Bucky Phillips takes the easy way out and gives up. When it came actually time, when he could have gone down shooting, he buried his gun and stood up with his hands over his head. He's brave when he had the gun in his hand and he's ambushing people and when his family's hiding him. But when we had him, when he wasn't in control, then he's coward. He was coward. After five months on the run, this small-time thief turned cop killer is back in custody and lucky to be alive. As much as you hate this guy, and you, you're angry at him, and he shot and killed one of your friends, we're not murderers. That's the difference between us and people like Bucky Phillips. Bucky is convicted of eight counts, including first degree murder and second degree attempted murder. Do you know what he said? Guilty as hell. All that bravado, guilty as hell. Ralph Bucky Phillips gets life without parole, locked in solitary confinement. Well, now Bucky Phillips is in a maximum security prison. He spends 23 hours a day locked by himself in a cell with a prison officer watching him at all times. He gets one hour where he's allowed to exercise in a small cage area, and that's it. That's his life. That's it. Durham County, Northern England, 1968. SKP John McVicker is in a village phone booth organizing a lift to London when he's approached by detectives. So I just looked at him and took off. And I just left them for dead. For the next three days, McVicker goes to ground and waits for his underworld contacts who've been paid to drive him back to London. And they said, get in the car, get in the car. And I, that was it. I, I knew I was safe. And they drove back to London. <laughs> back on familiar turf, McVicker is on top of the world. Yeah, it was a great, great feeling. Um, yeah, I've done it. But now he's wanted, dead or alive. He's public enemy number one. And I didn't know what was ahead of me, that I was going to eventually run out of... I was going to run out of steam. I was going to get caught or get killed. McVicker stays in London, avoiding capture for two long years. I had time to read and think, and I knew what a sort of shambles I'd made of my life, but the, the business of being out for two years um, changed my perspective on things because for the first time in my life, I was being, in my way, constructive. I was actually trying to build for a future. After committing one of the most audacious escapes in British prison history, McVicker's life on the run comes to an end when an underworld associate gives the police his address. I got betrayed, um, but I was going to get caught anyway. I'd run out of... Um, options, run out of ideas. John McVicker gets an extra three years for the escape, and he's back behind bars with a sentence of 26 years. I went back to prison. I served um, not that long, really. I served eight years. I studied all that eight years. I gained a couple of degrees and all the rest of it. Last year, he was paroled after an unusual Home Office decision that he had, quote, changed direction. The nature of this change was a much-praised autobiography examining the nature of crime and punishment, three A-levels, and a degree in sociology acquired from his prison cell. 
and I never thought of myself as being reformed or something silly like that. I didn't have that idea of being... I was the same person. I just chose to do something different. <laughs> Today, the former public enemy is a respected journalist. I've gone into prisons and lectured people like this and say, you know, it's... You, you, you know, you've turned yourself into a domestic animal and these warders are farming you. <laughs> and that's your choice. It's, you know, if you want to change, you make your choice and you come out and you find a job and you give up crime. That's your choice.